This is a whole seven minute message, so don't run away. <laughs> I think it's about five or seven minutes, so Matthew has a message too, I think. We're just going with what we feel the Lord wants, so it's hard to know ahead of time sometimes, and sometimes we do know everything almost ahead of time. And sometimes, like today, we had a good idea, but we're just going with what the Lord gives us, right? I hear a little baby cooing. It sounds so nice. Oh, it sounds like cute. Singing? Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> wow. Funny, I thought I heard a sound like that in my house last night. And it, I don't know, it was like a little baby sound. The, you know, the, you know, my little baby. And we went, wow, haven't heard that for like 40 years <laughs> in my house. It was so good at that sound. Maybe it was prophetic. I'm serious. It might have been. It was a sound like that. Yeah. It was the one where you always get up. Oh, go take care of the little baby. Now all my babies, well, not all of them are here, but now they're all like bigger than me, right? <laughs> Just feed them, they grow. You know, one of the most important things for every human being ever born is to know why you're here. And then you, you need to actually see yourself on God's map, like pinpointed on his map. And, and his map is in his heart. And then when you receive Christ... He actually puts the map inside of you. He actually writes it inside of you. And now you know your bearings. You know where you belong. So when you're born again, that's where it starts. As soon as you notice his call pulling on what he created you to come to him, he created you to come to him. But then when you, your little magnet in there goes beep, 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 beep. Even if it's weak, it goes beep, 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 like a little baby sound even, maybe beep, 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 kind of faint. Maybe the, beat, the heart's not even beating yet. You're not even formed, you know, and he's calling, right? You know, and in a number of places, Jesus said, and, and John also in John chapter 1, said, you can't even come to God unless he draws you. Jesus said that, and John said that a number of times. He said, it takes God to bring you to God, and then it, you just have to say yes. And then the whole journey is continuing to say yes. It's, it's just, it's, it's, it gets a little more complicated when you get tested with trials and temptations, right? But it, the whole journey is still as simple as saying yes all the time, right? And what God was giving me for today, he actually, he actually gave it to me, for me, part of it. A month ago, and I had a notebook beside my bed, well, way down in a drawer that I hardly ever use because I usually use a computer for things now. And, and uh, I just had something from him. I don't know if it was the middle of the night or something, and I, I, I you was know, fumbling through a drawer full of books, and I get it, get the notebook out, and I, I find a pen, and the pen's not writing right because it's never been used for a long time, and I, I write it down what he said, and. Uh, it was just several sentences, but I left it open there for a month or two now. I just left it by my bed, like, don't want to forget that. And every time I walk by, don't forget that. Don't forget that. And what, he, what the Lord was foreseeing was my next two months. That it was going to be really busy, spiritually, like all kinds of prayer meetings and a lot of, a lot of stuff goes on that isn't on Sunday, right? And it can be very actually taking you away a bit from your intimacy with God. So you can be praying for the whole world, praying, I can be praying for you guys, but un unless you spend your time with the Lord, just with him intimately and privately, your compass will, I don't know, your, your heartbeat starts to grow faint. And unless you, you notice, you, if you don't notice it, you lose your bearings. And, and, and what he shared with me, he just said, so simply, make me your only point of reference. 
in spite of relating to all these other points, that doesn't mean you don't pray with other people and you don't have people in your house and you don't engage in all these important things. I'm not talking about worldly things. I'm talking about the important things. How about the distractions of relatively unimportant things, all the worldly things that can dilute? And he, he just so gave that to me. And I found in the last two months, that's been the struggle. It's like, i got to get back to this secret place. And I was actually sharing this with Rose yesterday. We were out for a bike ride, and we stopped for a while. And we're laying in some sand overlooking the ocean. And, and I was just saying, it's like a compass. You know, with a, a compass has to have a north. Can you hear me? Good back there? Yeah? A compass needs a north, a north pole, magnetic earth, right? God does things in a way that in the animal kingdom, in, in nature, in science, and everything, he's speaking everywhere. The scripture says that in Romans chapter 1. He says, everything speaks of the glory of God, right? Even the earth has a core. And something about the core perhaps creates the magnetism. I don't know. I, I got grade 6 science, right? I mean, I went to grade 12, but, you know, maybe they got some new science now. Is the earth core, what is it? I don't know. But there's magnetism, <laughs> and it has a core. It's you, It's iron. That's iron. Okay, well, that, that there. So it's still the same science. Good. So, you know, we have a magnetic core in us. It's Christ in us. When you receive Christ, there he is. And, and he gave you the ability to get your bearings off of him. And it, it's actually quite simple to make a compass. That little needle will always point north and south. And if you get bewildered, you know what the word bewildered means? Just like it sounds, bewildered. Like the wilderness has messed with you. And you kind of, I'm bewildered. Like the wilderness, now the wilderness has got me wandering and roaming. And the Lord said, but I've put myself in you so you never have to wander far. And yet, as Christians, we're challenged even with Christian stuff, godly stuff, even spiritual and, and gifts of the Spirit that we employ when we pray together and do all kinds of special things together. But that's not the compass. When we lose our intimacy in prayer, and I've, I've, I've many years ago I did that. I, I shared that maybe a month or so ago, right? Where I lost my compass for a long time, praying three hours a day, and I didn't even know God anymore. I just prayed in tongues and shouted at the devil. Stuff like that. It was a, a move. <laughs> It wasn't a move of God. It was a move of hype, right? I mean, there was a bit of God there, but it really got off. It started off with a famous evangelist starting out something called the Daily Hour of Prayer, which swept across North America, and everybody's going the Daily Hour. Well, then some hyper, you know, we weren't all hyper, but then we went to two hours, and then finally some went to three. And You know, the, when I got to three, I was, so, I was further from God than when I was doing one. Because it was kind of formatted prayer. We were doing the Lord's Prayer as a format. And it was very regimented. But we can get on to even past regimented. We can get to very, 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 very meaningful. Like how about lo loving your little baby, right? Like how much does it take out of you? A lot, right? Middle of the night, like multiple times a night. Like your turn, your turn. And, you know, or, usually it was my wife's turn. She was a, little, a lot more energy and I had concrete work to do in the daytime. So I kind of got off that shift a lot and... Yeah, anyways, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad God gave you lots of energy and a, and a, and a motherly instinct too, right? And uh, she did it all with love, right? Think of how much even precious things like that can take. But what if we don't take time with the Lord privately, personally, and just... There's a term that people use for this, is beholding the Lord. You don't even have to pray. You don't hardly have to use words. In fact, the less words, the better. It's words of just, what's going on in my heart? And you don't try and pray for every, everything in the world and every concern and every prayer list that comes up online. And, you know, I've, I've signed up for uh, different things online, Christian concern things like action this and convoy that. And I'm not kicking that. I paid my... I, I put myself on a regular, here's some money. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad you're doing all that. But eventually I got so many emails, like every day now. It's like, okay, action for this and fight for that. And 
I'm not going to lose this walk with God because I can feel it pulling away my time and my attention. And then, you know, the news. I, I like Epoch Times, personally. I think it's the best one out there. I've tried them all. <laughs> Unless there's one I haven't tried, Epoch Times is amazing. And I go there probably every day, maybe two, three times a day. But, you know, the trap is to follow the nasty things that are all going on all around us that track with Bible prophecy and, and we identifying that's something of our battle. And yet... Matthew found this a while back, and I found this. We had to pull away from how much time we were being distracted by all that stuff. Not to say there's anything wrong with that stuff. There isn't. Nothing wrong with it. And we do need to keep abreast of the facts. But how much, right? What is your key? You know, when, when it comes, we're in the tribulation now. I, I firmly believe it. I'm not all alone in that. <laughs> when we get into the thick of this, it's not going to be how much you know of what they're up to that will save you. It's who you know. It's who you know deeply. Not in a passing handshake kind of way. Oh, yeah. No. I mean, how about save you from freaking right out? How about save you from getting absolutely crazy angry because of some horrible injustice like horrible maybe it happens to somebody very very close to you then if you're not abiding in christ in an intimate way you'll lose it you will whatever's in you that's not of god is going to come out i mean i got tested even at the first strokes of covid nazism I got my bristles up and I grew porcupine quills really fast against mask Nazis at, at the doors. Some of them were Nazis. And some were just, you know, hey, you know, but some actually had this, like it was like a Nazi spirit. I didn't, you know, wow. People that, like 18-year-old girls running a furniture store who never had any authority in their life all of a sudden have the authority to address a senior like he's a little eight-year-old disobeying uh, nursery school and being a really bad boy, and talking you down like you're a bad boy. You think I didn't give her a little talking to? <laughs> but you know, I pulled out of that. I had to pull out of that because I realized, what's this doing? It's dragging me down into their hole, and it's a nasty hole. Our only hope in these days is the call we were given to start with. And you know, you know what the tribulation, I think, is, is for? I think it's for two things. One is to help us to get all the way close to Jesus because we don't seem to quite get the point that we really need him that much. And so when the tests are on, it shows up all our weak points. And then we go, wow, I really do need him. But you know, you better not wait till the last minute where it's like uh, a little late to start growing in intimacy because it doesn't happen in about an hour. And the other is to tear down all the idols in, of the world. So... They're getting torn down, and we're being glorified in Christ because we're coming into him, and he's filling us and absolutely possessing us. So we shouldn't need a tribulation for that. The world needs it because they need, they've rejected Christ. And many that have, like, I, I'm, I, I like, if I could choose my own way, I'm, um, no, I'd just be who God wants me to be. But at different times, I kind of thought, I just feel like an evangelist, and I'm not, but it's in me, and I just <laughs> oh, tried to exhaust my whole life. And you know, Canada's the worst place I've ever been for that. I got to go with my missionary brother to Central America once, and uh, you could witness to anybody. And you give them a tract, and they'd read it, and then three people would be reading it with them, and pretty soon you'd see people all over reading it. And then you'd see a truck of people driving by you at half an hour later, waving their tracks. Thank you. Does that sound like Canada? So what does that do to an evangelist's heart? <laughs> I still have that heart. I witness to everybody that I feel an opening with, right? And, and God sends people. But Canada hasn't been ready. But you know what? I might have to suffer some lack, like the price of a loaf of bread right now or anything my wife said cauliflower was 850 a head like oh that's crazy so I, we didn't buy cauliflower so, you know <laughs> but i mean it's gonna 
There's going to be other things that I'm believing God to provide. I have been, even when I had a bunch of money in the bank, I still was going, God, grow me some trees in my yard that have stuff growing all year round. Like, I still, I still believe that stuff. Even when I had, and now I have less, not that I'm broke, but, you know, I'm living on old age pension. <laughs> my house is paid for it, but we're living on old age pension, you know, cash in an RSP every so often, right? And so I'm believing God to do supernatural things to provide. But the world is going to suffer great lack. And they're going to be all around us. And like my brother missionary in Central America has been there like, I don't know, 25, 30 years. He's been through disaster after disaster after disaster. And we're, we're talking about what we would think would be a world-ending disaster. Like, would you think of six or eight feet of rain in a few days being a bit of a disaster? When over half the country is underwater in more than one country? That's a bit of a disaster, yeah, right? Especially people living in grass, grass houses and little brick houses that they put together and they're already so poor, right? But he said, after every disaster, they come flooding into the kingdom. <laughs> Just flooding it. We're going to get to see that. But we're going to suffer through it. But we have to be ready. How are you going to be ready? Are you going to be one of the ones in the corner going, I don't know what to do. You know, I'm overwhelmed. No, if you're filled with God, you'll be strong and do exploits. So God's preparing you through intimacy, not through tracking with the news of how bad it is. Because we're the ones that are going to be the ones that show up shiny and on the spot because we've been with Jesus. That's what they said when they... When they when the religious people of, of, of the first apostles, they said of them, they said, yeah, these guys have been with Jesus. <laughs> that was awesome, hey? So our point of relativity is Jesus Christ. I said all that to say this, that one thing. He is your only point of relativity. Is your wife or your husband your point of relativity? Hopefully not. You're going to get your cues from them? Because they're going to have a down day or a down moment or a down little spell. And, and they might not track as well as you for a little bit. I rely on my wife a lot. She relies on me a lot, I hope. And, but we both rely on God. Because we don't track perfectly. But we rely on God personally before we rely on each other. And that's the key. What if you're both down one day? You, you, you need, we need Jesus beyond any measure we realize. We just don't know. You get born again by him. You keep following by him. You breathe every breath by him. In him we live and move and have our being. That's the reality of things. The scripture says he upholds all things by the word of his power. That means the whole of all creation is in constant suspension by his word and will. Do you realize what that means? That means if he just went, everything would cease to exist. So all, even the atomic structure of creation is being held together by him, dependent. So if you think you're in some way independent of God, you are absolutely dependent beyond any measure you know. So a disciple of Christ is one who gets their identity from Christ, and not just once upon a time, I learned all my lessons, you're special, Jesus loves me, this I know, and uh, I've been born again, and that's it. You have to keep that identity by keeping your compass flotational. You know, if you turn the thing sideways, it's not going to work, right? What if you put a bunch of nails in your pocket and put the compass in there? It's going to throw the whole thing off, right? Or what if you put metal all over your body? You have iron all over you. Well, that'd be like idols. What if you had idols all over you, hanging all over you? Would your compass work? It's going to go right towards you. We're not supposed to be self-centered. That's another lie. And modern Christian religion has started to give people the sense that their bearings are not Christ. They wouldn't say that, but they say that what they do is they read religion through the help of demons has started to redirect your attention to what the religion says, that's Jesus and this is Jesus and this, this group we got going here and this, this doctrine we got here and this is the thing we do over here and pretty soon you're all tied in knots and you go, that's all Jesus. But you feel further away from him than you might have the first week you were born again. And you are. But you're mature in a religious eye. 
You might even be a pastor <laughs> or an apostle. <laughs> you might be traveling and writing books, right? I hate to say it, but one book that I, I'm not going to say who it was or what, but this guy, he was a mover and shaker, com considered to be the apostle of the apostles in North America and wrote books on it. And they were all, this guy, this guy. And I heard him speak and I go, I don't feel even a little bit of my heart moving. Nothing didn't move my heart. My heart for Jesus didn't get moved. But he had all this talk. And they were all applauding, reading his books, teaching his, his stuff. And then I, I, I thought, well, i got to buy his book, his top book. I, I couldn't get a single bit of Jesus juice out of a single page. <laughs> we have to find Jesus. But much of our Christianity has lost Jesus in substance. But we still have him in name. We put his name on everything. You know, you could bumper stick him all over your whole body and still not know him. It just doesn't work. But you know what's nice? He said, he began you with mercy. Hey, he began you in mercy. And he carries you in mercy. So you go, well, Lord, I, I feel so far. Everybody hears at a different distance in their relationship. He goes, yeah, but I got it all. I got you pinpointed in mercy. I've got you. I brought you in under blood. Do you think you're ever going to ever not need the blood to even approach me? So just enjoy yourself. So the neat thing was with Abraham, and this stuck out to me a month ago, and I, got, I knew I had to share it one day here. I just didn't know what day. I just saw the journey of Abraham in just real simple form and how important that was for us to understand why was it that Abraham, it says, believed God and God counted that belief for righteousness? You remember that? He said he justified him, right? Justified him. Well, Abraham left everything on the word of God that came to him personally. He said, Leave all that, which was a civil, it was a apparently relatively advanced civilization with nice big homes. They've done archaeological digs, so I heard. Haven't been there. <laughs> and they were all big houses and looked like people were really well off and it was a really nice civilization. He had to go live in a tent for the rest of his life. And Hebrews 11 says that Abraham and his whole family were like that because they were pilgrims. There's another scripture that has been dear to my heart that speaks of that, that says, blessed are those who have their heart set on a pilgrimage. They go from, I think it goes, they go from glory to glory. Something like that. It's in the Old Testament. It's a very, you never hear it preached. That's why I always forget where it is because nobody ever preaches it. It just, just stood out to me like decades ago and sometimes I've looked it up and hunted, you know, and find it again, you know. Blessed are those whose hearts are set on a pilgrimage. They go from glory to glory. Hebrews 11 speaks of a whole cloud of witnesses like that. He says, these are the kind of people that you want to be the people with. These are your people. You're set on a pilgrimage. God has called you on a pilgrimage. And so you never settle down. And when is, when is you know, do you know that God said to Abraham, like, leave your family? He had to leave his family. Remember, Jesus said stuff like that. Sometimes you'll have to even leave family. It doesn't mean you want to. And, like, you don't want to abandon your family, and you wanted them all to follow the Lord, and sometimes they all do, right? Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't for a while. But you can't say, well, I'm going to go where they're going, but no, you go where God's calling you. And he, he, he took Lot with him, and that was probably a mistake. But Lot tagged along. And in no time at all, they started fighting because he didn't get along. And then Lot went down into Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, that was a really nice place. <laughs> I, I'm sure it had its pluses, right, that attracted them. The city, city life, right? I've always liked city life because of all the convenience. I want to get something and just 10 minutes, you got it, right? Now I'm looking for country life. I want to move. But, of course, I'm an old guy now, so I don't need a job. <laughs> I can just go move out in the country, I hope. And if he lets me. We have our house for sale. And uh, 
but it's been for sale for a year, so it hasn't sold yet. So, so far he hasn't let me in, Rose moved, but you know, maybe one day. But it's not to hide by ourselves. There's going to be other people, I believe, out there. And it'll be got a, a lot of good God stuff, right? But I have my heart set on a pilgrimage. And I know a lot of you do, and that's why you're here. Is you're not in the status quo. But, you know, in each of our lives, in some way, we are in the status quo a bit. Because everybody somehow settles down a little bit, right? And, and that's what God's, I think, speaking to all of us today. Get your bearings from me. Because I have a... What, this is called a bridal journey, and a bridal journey is, it, it takes some time to be fully prepared, and that's his intent. He says, I'm taking you, I've had my eye on you from before you were born, I created you for myself, and I'm calling you to myself, and I provide the whole, everything for the trip. I provide myself. So first I do, I put myself in you, and he says, if you follow myself, Jesus, who's now in you, and you put everything else away as second or third or not, not worthy at all to even be there. There's a lot of things not worthy to be there. But if I be your true north, your true compass, your one and sole desire, you'll make it. And that's why Abraham was justified before he ever arrived at the end. God said, you're righteous every day of your life that you're on this journey. You are justified. So you don't walk around with your head low and always thinking, how far off am I? That's not, you don't get your bearings that way. You're justified by the blood of Jesus. You get your bearings from Christ. That's why he says, you never get cowered down under shame. So, you know, Romans uh, chapter uh, uh, 7, going from 6 into 7, it's, it's really cool. And, and he says, uh, and then 7 into 8, um, he says... When, he's, when he talks about now we're divorced from the law to be joined to Christ. So it's not the law that leads you. But yet he says your righteousness has to exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees who made the law everything. But to them, God was very little and law was very big. And Jesus came and said, no, I will be myself written inside of you and you are accountable to follow me. Not to be nitpickers and always trying to judge other people and yourself by a little this, a little that, you know, and, and, and you'll miss me entirely because I've justified you. So what am I dealing with in your life today? He doesn't deal with everything at once, you know. In fact, you won't even realize all your faults at once. You'll think you're perfect when you're like a year old. I did. A year old in the Lord. I thought, I can't think of a single thing wrong with me. <laughs> My wife could, I think. <laughs> she cut on later, a little more, you know, more. But I couldn't because I was doing all that was in my heart to do. I followed him with all my heart. First year, second year, third year, followed him with all my heart. I didn't have a sense of condemnation, usually. It was just, but he was always introducing new things to me, like, oh, did you notice that? Whoa, really? <laughs> you know? So you deal with it because you're accountable to him, right? And it's all about that intimacy. You're justified. You're justified when you're a little baby Christian. You, you just, you, you, you're, as a baby, you're supposed to feel really comfortable. You're just cuddling up in his arms, and he, you have never done a single thing right or wrong, but you have sin in you because your parents had sin and your ancestors had sin. Adam had sin. It's just in there. Wait till you get three, and it'll, some of it will start coming out more, you know? And, uh, and when you're 16, maybe a whole lot more. But he goes, I loved you every day. I loved you every single day, and I justified you. But what I look for in you is obedience to what I do reveal. And I do ask of you is that you commit your way to me to a pilgrimage. And whatever, and that you actually seek me. You don't just casually go, okay, I'm going to avoid you so that I don't clue into anything so I don't have to obey anything. Well, that's not what he said. He said, seek me with all your heart and, and love me with all your heart. And I'll keep you. I'll keep you from the world. I'll keep you from the flesh that's in you until it's gone and you get a new body, I'll even make that even better. It'll start to obey. And you'll start to rule over that. And you'll rule over your mind, which is just all over the place. And uh, you will reign and rule with me because I've made you more than a conqueror. What is more than a conqueror? I didn't do all the conquering. You're more than a conqueror. You're Jesus 
said it's finished when he died on the cross. He conquered for you. And he said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. In the world, you'll suffer tribulation, but I've overcome it. When I was a young Christian, I thought, that's the craziest statement. How does that help me? You overcame it. You know, I'm glad for you, but I personally don't feel like I've overcome it all that much yet, right? And, and looking at the tribulation, and he goes, no, you'll suffer tribulation, but be of good cheer, because I've overcome it. Uh-huh. You mean I get a happy ending after I suffer a whole bunch and die? Yeah, well, you do, but it's way more than that. I'll actually, I'll be with you right now. And by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony, you will overcome the Antichrist. And the word, word of your testimony means the book of your story and how, you, how do you live out the living testimony of Christ in you? Because you are a witness of Christ. And witness, in the Greek, guess what word God picked to identify us? It was a Greek word that existed called martyr. And every time you see the word witness in the New Testament, being a witness, it's, it's the word martyr. <laughs> that doesn't mean, and so it took on a, a form of, it could be a witness, but it could be you actually do die. So you, it's that level of commitment. That's what it's all about. If you're a witness unto Christ, it means my whole life is Christ's. And so he says here, I think I'll read it here. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So we're talking about two principles here. The, the principle and the fundament of the law of the spirit of life. Christ is in you. He is your life. And that makes you free from the law of sin and death. Right? So you don't have to follow Judaizers that want to take you back into Judaism and obey 615 laws. I met a guy that had really... Uh, gone keen on that, uh, a good friend, and I'd heard different numbers over the years of how many laws the Jews were supposed to keep, and here's a man that's been keen on it for years, and I said, how many laws? I thought I heard 586 or something. He goes, oh no, it was, I think he said 616, but then he said, but there is another guy that came up with another number of 676 or something like that. So even, even the most fastidious Jews combing through their scriptures for decades can't seem to find enough laws. It just, we found some more. Well, I guess, if you're, like, like it says in the scriptures, if you're guilty of one, you're guilty of them all. <laughs> so is that the way that God gave us? He said, no, a perfect way has come. Christ in you. The hope of glory. So let's get all our bearings from Jesus. Let's get rid of condemnation. Let's get rid of shame. Let's put that out of the way and be happy to be his and have that beautiful, perfect relationship, however immature you are. Just be a happy, immature person. <laughs> and tomorrow you'll be a happy, quite less mature person, right? <laughs> and, and when you hear a real bad thing about yourself, somebody, something comes up and you, you're really ashamed and you go, on oh, that way? Like, I, I face that regular. You think, still? Yeah. And you go, I could just get ashamed to go. No, I bounce right out of it. I go, well, I just sincerely repent. I take it to the Lord sincerely. Not like a quick, you know, pew, pew, pew. okay, God, I say these words. I repent of this. Now it's all good and clean. I go, no, I really, I don't want this. And, and you work, you talk with him about it. And you get up happy. You just get up, happy, keep going, you know? And if a week later you go, oh, I think I see some of that still there. Oh, okay, because I'm justified, because my heart is right, because I don't want to sin. That's the difference between being born again and not born again. If you're born again, you don't want to sin. And, and, and I, I, I've heard some people think that there may be a vast number of people that go to church and have been there their whole life that he thinks are not even saved. And, and then we try and disciple people that never got born again. And then they condemn themselves and they go, 
yeah, I've been working on that and it just beats me down. I'm a slave to it. Decade after decade, and maybe you didn't get born again. You just thought you were. Like me, I thought I was at one time. Kept on sinning, thought I was born again. You know, the gospel just washed right over me. <laughs> Seriously, it was weird. Until finally, somehow, God got through to me. It was just an odd thing. So make sure you're born again. And then go from glory to glory. You know, I remember, last thing, one time I was a fairly new Christian, and the Lord said, like really new, hey Rose, like half a year old, and the Lord maybe, maybe four, three months old. And I'd already had like a powerful salvation experience. I'd gone from sin and darkness to light. And, oh, and when the people that ministered to me were praying for me, I saw demons leaving. I didn't even know what it was. Faces of evil things. Wow, you know? And then I just was a different guy. Well, like a few months later, the Lord says uh, to me, Rose and I worked across the street from each other in downtown Kamloops. I worked at a furniture store, and she worked at a, what kind of store? A bookstore. And uh, we're driving home Friday night, and the Lord just said, like, think, a new Christian. Did I know the voice of God a lot? It was kind of a new thing to me, but I just knew it. It's just a knowing, right? It's like, why don't you go to the, it was a Lutheran church, right, that my parents went to. And there was a charismatic pastor that we'd been fellowshipping with in a charismatic group for just a few months until we transitioned into a full-on Holy Ghost church, right? And we, had, we didn't go to the Lutheran meetings, but we went to Pentecostal-type Holy Ghost meetings in the nighttime. Well, this is a Friday night. There's no meeting scheduled, nothing at all. And, and the Spirit just said, go down to the church on a Friday night. And so we missed the turnoff for our house and drove away to the other end of town and show up. And the pastor's there, and he says, I was waiting for you. The Lord told me to come down here, and you were, come. <laughs> That's an appointment with God. We could have missed it because the, I, I got the impulse just like a little bit before the turnoff, you know, and I don't drive slow. So, <laughs> and we get there and he's got like, this is kind of a almost Catholic Anglican kind of thing, but it was, God visited it. You know what I mean? He later told me, put out your candles and get rid of your Jesus picture and your cross. I did that later. But at that time he goes, I'll indulge that. That's nice. So we go up to the Lutheran altar and you all get down on your knees against a big bar and it's all carpeted and very comfortable on your knees. And they get all the nice candles lit and it's very romantic, but God was there. He really was. And we just got to my knees and waves of God were washing and washing, like just going through me, and I was over oh, in tongues, just waves and waves, and just weeping in tongues with joy and weeping and washing. And after 10 minutes of weeping and washing, I got up, and he says, Pastor said, well, I guess that's it. <laughs> and we all went home. Well, I got deliverance. I don't know what I was getting delivered of. Maybe it was demons, maybe it was me. It was layers. Right? And uh, you're going to need to get that through your whole life. Layers of deliverance. Layers and layers and layers until you're a beautiful bride. So, and he doesn't condemn you any minute along the way unless you become condemned because you actually go away. But as long as you're on the pilgrimage, you're justified. Like Abraham. I'm not going to preach. Well, I'm just going to, um, I know some of you want to go. I just, uh, I will say, uh, Stephen, we're going to order some pizza, hang out after at the house. We're just going to be doing more of that now. Just getting time to get to know each other, have fellowship. So if you want to hang around, um, yeah, one sec. Yeah. And then, uh, so yeah, just keep that in mind. Um, I just want to be able to respond to what he said. I have some, you know, two nights ago I was, I had two nights where I had just really bad dreams and it was just demonic and I felt so slimed. And every morning I woke up, one morning I woke up and I'm like, you know, because I went to bed praying and I'm like, God, it's not fair. Like, why am I getting just trash in my sleep? And I wake up and I feel like I need to like get cleansed. And, and he's like, well, and then I, he showed me a picture of the ark. Noah's Ark, and he's like, I'm building an ark in this time, and the ark is Christ, and then he showed me 
the spirit, I zoomed in and I saw the door to the ark. And he says, I, may, I told Noah to design the door of the ark that it could only be shut by me. And I was like, what does that mean? Because, I mean, you got to think he's already, you got to, and it says in the scriptures, as in the days of Noah, so it will be at the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And we are in those days. And so how, what does he mean? Well, there's lots to it. I'm not going to preach a sermon. But there is an element. And he also says that he would no longer judge the world with water, with a flood. But he does say it before his second coming that the earth, the earth is going to be purified by fire. So God is making an ark that's fireproof. And um, <laughs> that's quite an ark. But he also said in this, as I, in this encounter with him, he said, anything left outside the ark is up for grabs. Anything in your soul, anything in your life that you're not putting in Christ is up for grabs. So that was, so he was saying, like, there's elements of my soul that are still not in him. So then I'm like, Lord, <laughs> get me in the ark. <laughs> You know, and, the, and so the ark is Christ, intimacy coming in. Wow, that's good. So that's a, the sound that's we're supposed to close out. Yeah. So, um, so and you know, just I felt like today the Lord's inviting, Holy Spirit's inviting us. I think maybe we, maybe some of us I feel have lost this idea that we're on a pilgrimage, and today we're reminded. You know, because we we get so lost and just providing for our family and just living life and we we lose the the story and god's reminding us today to reset our intention in our heart because instead of abraham the father of our faith that he was looking for a city whose builder and maker was god he could have lived in a palace but he lived in a tent and it's in this time, there's so much of the church is focused and in love with the things of this world. And the scripture says to set our mind and our heart on the, on the things above. For the things below are temporary. And I think in this year especially, I think we're going to see the, how temporary things are. So if our hearts and our hopes are set on temporal things, the money in our bank account, how much work we have, how many friends we have, it's meaningless when things start to shake. So, uh, Christy, if you want to come up, we're going to do some a little bit of worship, and then uh, if you feel like you want some ministry, the front is open. Um, but I, I would just encourage us to just do some business with the Lord today, and recommit your walk, recommit. And I felt earlier in worship, I said, you know, that the Holy Spirit was highlighting things in different people of like, oh man, I realized some areas in my life that need to realign, that need to get in the ark, so to speak. So. I would just encourage us to, to consider your ways. Rose? Hi, everyone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi. Um, when I first came, I had this vision, and I thought, ooh, and it hasn't left me, so that to me means I should share it. Um, and... God does give me pictures, and so I'm learning to respond. And sometimes I don't even know what they fully mean until I start talking. So um, if I stumble, you'll understand. But what I saw was I saw the bride, and this bride was laying flat on the floor. And she had this beautiful but simplistic white dress on, but she was laying on the floor. I went... Oh, what's that about God? So we're all called to be the bride, and it's an invitation. And the bride that I saw laying down is that, yes, as the bride, we do get weary. We do get discouraged, and some of us are sleeping, taking a nap. And so understanding that as the different ones speak up here, it's like a constant invitation from the Holy Spirit to draw you in close to Him. When you are a bride, you're usually pretty excited about your future, what's to come. And as, as Kelly was sharing, 
I noticed that the bride that was laying down, that was weary, tired, asleep, frustrated, whatever emotions, but just non-responsive. But as he was sharing, I noticed that the bride sat up and and kind of woke up from their her slumber. And it's like, oh, oh. So out there, the bride everywhere, we're in different places. We're in different situations in our life and we may be laying down, we may be frustrated, we may be bogged down with the affairs of what's happening in our lives. We may be not even aware that God is inviting you. And uh, when we are, when things are revealed to us or we feel convicted about something or, you know, you get a smack or whatever the case may be, it's not for condemnation or to put you back down. It's to invite you because he wants you close to him. And you want to be close to him. And, and some don't even have a grid for it and others do. And so I see that the Lord is inviting us to be aware that he is calling you close to him, close to him, and that everything that goes on around you there is a goal and a purpose that he wants you close to his bosom. And so we can be excited about that. So when God shows you things or you feel, you know, down about something, just remember you're that bride and he's drawing you close. And uh, yeah, and so the bride is arousing. The bride is rising up. So hear the call. Well, yeah, I just remembered one thing I kind of forgot to say was the ark door it's shut from the outside. And so what the Lord was saying is what started by grace is going to finish by grace. So it's not up to us to finish the work. So the, the elements of our soul and things that we feel we're struggling with, I feel there's an extra grace in this season because the Lord wants us to come into him, can come away from the, whether it's unbelief, fear, addictions whatever but his grace is available and I, I think so the door noah built the ark knowing that only god could shut the door when it started raining and it's like we're in that time where it's like god i'm looking at the giants i'm looking at all the things and i'm like the door's open <laughs> i can't shut the door and i if you feel like that in your life i think that that was like the main point i forgot so Lord, we just ask even today, God, areas in our life that we feel are open and exposed, would you shut the door? You know, all he's looking for us is just to come to him. He does the work. But, you know, the Lord was reminding me this week, he's like, just don't quit. You know, this year I've gone through a lot. You know, actually, the last five years I've gone through incredible battles, personal, relational, and so many times the Lord's just like, if you don't quit, you'll win. And I feel like some of us need to hear that. Just don't quit. Because if you quit, you lost. So today, let's just, if you feel like you have been quitting, whether it's like feeling unworthy or a track record of failure. I mean, I can't remember how many times my dad was telling me about the becoming the bride. And I'm like, that's nice. I... I just hope I make it through the gate, the pearly gates, you know, like really, I was so beat down and discouraged and, uh, and so, but God could meet us wherever we're at. And so, and maybe that's, you know, you're hearing this message and you know, someone that feels, I feel there's people here that should be here that aren't here, but you know them and they're discouraged. They're not even, they don't, they're just don't even think they're worthy to even, is there even a chance to even get to the to get into the game they know that god's real they know that he loves them but they're just so covered in shame and they're beating themselves up so you maybe even just now i feel the lead to pray for those lord those that are should be here that aren't because the enemies put them in a prison of shame and condemnation maybe people we know lord we just we just lift them up right now too lord lord would you go after them you you delight he says all of heaven rejoices in the, the salvation of one lost sheep and that you leave the 99 to go for the one and that's your heart and i i just feel that heart right now coming lord would you go after lord the people let's just pray right now lord just people that we know in our lives in our circle in our network in our family and friends 
the enemies had their way, Lord. We, we, we come together even now, Lord. We just send your force, your angels and, and the Holy Ghost to, to grab them from their prison. And Lord, if you have even a, a, a part in, for us to play, and we've been shrugging it off because we've been busy with our own life, I, got, I pray right, even right now you highlight people in our hearts right now that we're supposed to, that you put on our hearts to go after. In one, whether it's praying for them or reaching out to them, and we've been missing it and shrugging off our responsibility. Lord, I ask right now, remind us. We repent, Lord, because you, you're, Lord, if there's, give us, I've just released ideas and divine wisdom on how you want us to, to go after that. Lord, people that you want us to pray for, Lord. Re, Lord, I ask for just a renewed uh, um, fast passion, Lord, to, to pray. To pray for the lost, to pray for the, sh the lost sheep, the prodigals, Lord. And whether even in our own hearts, where we've been the prodigal, where we've gone astray, Lord, I, Lord, today, seal up that, seal us up into you, shut that door. You know the the riot, the 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 people that rode in the ark, it wasn't so bad. The ark, God has shown me the ark He has for this time, in the in the world, it, it's going to be such shaking. Those who get in the ark early, <laughs> it's going to be a ride of our lives. And there's going to be rich relationships and fellowship. It says in uh, the Bible that those who feared the Lord spoke to one another in this time. And so you see God's bringing, uh, bringing us together in the fear and the reverential fear of the Lord. And there's a, there's a coming together in the ark. And there's going to be provision in the ark. Some of you are needing breakthrough provision. Well, get in the ark. Get in Christ. Seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all the things that you worry about will be taken care of.